One of the things I know God's best at is removing stumbling blocks. Take you away the stone. Okay? Man, I appreciate that. That's good. That really is. That blesses me. And I, I needed that. I did. I needed that. Um, as I said uh, this morning during Sunday school, um, I didn't know what I was going to preach. And so I know when I get there, I can't, I can't just, I don't, I don't download sermons. I don't download preach somebody else's sermons. I don't do that. Um, I know a lot of preachers that do because they don't like to study and they just want it all written out for them. And that's awful. But, um, so I went to the Lord and I said, God, I need something to preach to your people, your people. And I need something to preach. And God said, well, what's on your heart? And it's funny that God you know, laid that on me because God always knows what's in our heart. So I know he wasn't asking for his own curiosity. Mike, what are you thinking about? I can't, I don't, I don't know. Um, and I told him and God said, preach that. So I'm going to do that. Um, you see up on the screen, Ezekiel 2, and I want you to turn your Bibles there. And, and I really do want you to turn your Bibles there, okay? Um, and that it, it has to do with what I'm going to preach this morning. Uh, if all you get from the Lord comes from me, you're not going to get much. I promise you, you're not going to get much. Um, I'm not getting younger. I, I will say that I I do feel better all around. I did I did uh, yard work this weekend, and I wanted Lisa to put a big medal on my chest and pat me on the back and tell me how good it was. And and uh, you know, since having my gallbladder ripped right out of me, but um, I I, I kind of feel better. And I, I've this week I think I've been pretty productive. And getting some things done, and and uh, yesterday uh, I set about and recorded two Watchmen broadcasts back to back. Now that takes several hours, and uh, the bad part of it is the second one that I was recording. At some point, my foot must have got a hold of the microphone cable, and it pulled the microphone off my my jacket. So when I got done, I went to look for my microphone. It's laying on the floor. And when did that happen? So I put the, the SD cards in the computer to find out. And I think I got about halfway through the second one. So I'm either going to release that one with bad audio. It has audio on it, but it's not good audio like I like. Or I'm going to have to go redo it, at least half of it. And I'm going to have to do it in a hurry because I know Lisa's going to cut our hair this week. So it'll look funny if I've got this haircut for the first half of the Watchmen and I got a tight buzz cut getting ready for camp for the second part of the Watchmen broadcast. But I've, I've been getting, you know, I got, got a lot done and, and, uh, and I like it. But I can tell you that probably the number one disease that affects every pastor is discouragement. Discouragement. It shows up, it rolls in, and I mean, it don't, it, it, it don't take much for people, for God's men to get discouraged. Now, I will say, I, I'll just say for me, uh, I'm thin-skinned, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm pretty easily to offend, I get my feelings hurt a lot, I try not to show it, uh, you... I don't know, you may not know it if all you see of me is behind the pulpit or behind one of the cameras I have upstairs or whatever, but but I, I get I get my feelings hurt even at things that are not real. That I guess I just dreamed it up in my mind that it's this way and so on. Uh, and I get heavy hearted and, and uh, then I start thinking, well, what good am I doing? What good am I doing? This morning I'm going to preach out of, of, of actually, my plan was when, when the Lord gave me the word that I would be looking for all through the scriptures to search it out, 
Um, man, we're talking into the hundreds of places this one word is used. So obviously I'm not going to do that. But I, I fell upon one place in the scripture that I'm, I'm very familiar with. And that is the first few chapters of the book of Ezekiel. And I know what God told Ezekiel before he sent him to be a prophet and to be a watchman over the house of Israel. I know what he said to him. And if, I was, if, if God would have told me this, the night that I, uh, 16 years old, came down to this altar and I accepted God's call to the ministry, I, I think maybe if I would have known how bad it would be at times, I might not have been down at all. To be honest with you. It's not an easy job sometimes. Literally, people's souls are in my hands. That's a big thing. It's like a guard. Someone in the military, you guys that are in the military, been in the military, there's, when you're in a place where the enemy's near and you've got guys on guard duty, the safety of the men that they are commanded to stand guard over, their lives are in your hand. If you fail to do what you've been trained and called to do, those men are going to, they're going to die that night while they're asleep. They're going to die in their beds because you fell asleep or because you weren't looking in the right direction or you didn't show up or whatever, any number of reasons. Their blood is on your hands and the Bible makes that very clear. So I'm going to read that to you this morning out of Ezekiel. Before I start, the word that God laid on my heart to search out in the scripture was the word hear, heareth, hearing, all the forms of the word hear. Because sometimes I think people have ears but they don't hear the message. They don't hear what God's saying. And that's, that's troubling to me. Because as far as this church goes, the message from God a lot of times will come from me. And there are things over the years that I've preached, and I've preached them over and over and over and over. And it just seems like it just rolls off people. And nobody cares. Nobody does anything. That's how, that's, that's how preachers think sometimes. It's just part of it. We're, if I didn't care about whether you listened or not, I wouldn't be a good pastor. Somebody give me a verse that just comes to your mind or your heart about hearing what God said. Yes. That was the first one on my list. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. So if you've got ears and you're not hearing, how can you have faith? I mean, you've got the Bible. But if you don't open the thing up and read it every now and then, or at least hear it preached every now and then, if you don't do that, you've got ears. But the, all they are is just glasses holders. Right, Chris? Chris is putting his glasses on. As soon as I said that, he put his glasses on. Give me another one. Somebody else. Go ahead, sis. The other Melissa. I'm looking for the word here. That's a good one, but I, I like it. Yes, Alicia. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. In Revelation, Jesus' phrase repeated to the seven churches was, Let him who hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the seven churches. Okay, seven spirits of God, seven churches. Sounds simple. But let him who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Somebody give me another one. Go ahead with the other one you had. Okay. 
Anybody else? Verses that have to do with hearing what God said. Yes, Sister Lynn. Amen. Look at 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. Somebody read that to us this morning. Loud. Go ahead, Megan. No, 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. Not Gospel John. 1 John. You've heard, you've seen it, and he said you've even handled it with your hands. That means that the Word of God, like God told the Israelites, he said it's not up in the heavens to where we would say, who will go up to heaven and get the Word for us? God said, I put it right here. The Word is nigh thee even in thy mouth. That is the Word of faith. This is what Paul said. That is the Word of faith which we preach. So this morning, I want you to focus now and ask yourself the question. As I read through Ezekiel chapter 2, Ezekiel chapter 3, ask yourself the question, is this me? Is all I'm going to ask you to do, is this me? Now, I promise you, I've been preached to again with this message. I get them first. God deals with me. God preaches to me. And I have to examine myself and ask myself, Mike, are you giving heed to the Word of God? Are you listening to the Word of God? I, let me just tell a little short story and illustrate kind of where I'm going with this and why this was in my heart. Uh, you know, you learn as you go and make mistakes in life. You make mistakes in life and you're supposed to learn from those mistakes and, and try not to make them again. And nobody's perfect and I'm not perfect. And I can't say that from this day forward I was the perfect uh, husband in, in, in every regard. But several years ago, God was going to teach me something about being a husband. My wife had just come here to the church to be part of uh, what we were doing here, and at the time, what we were doing was we had a Christian school, and she was working with the kids in the school. And there would be times when uh, those some of those older kids, they know how to push buttons, especially with women teachers. And she would come to my office, and she would... Uh, she would, uh, I could see the frustration in her. She would tell me, you know, what, what some kid was doing down there or this and that and the other. And uh, I, I guess at the time, you know, we hadn't been married too awfully long, but I guess at the time I thought maybe that my wife was just a female version of me. Bad mistake. And one day she came. She was pretty upset. She reeled off some things. I don't remember what they were. And I think I must have, uh, I think I must have yelled back at her. And she said, you know, anybody in this church can come in this office and do exactly what I just did and you'll listen to them. But me, you don't listen. Now God smote my heart with that and I didn't argue back. I didn't say, oh, that's not true. You know that's not true. I, I, didn't, I didn't do that. And I mean, God smote my heart. And God said, Mike, listen, your wife. She's the weaker vessel. I gave her to you because there are things in your life that are lacking severely in. And I gave you the wife that you need to fill in the severe gaps that you have. Somebody say amen. So I made a promise to her. I let it go for a while and I prayed about it. And when I thought I had an answer from God, I made a promise to her that I would, no matter what, I would try to listen to her from now on. Now again, I'm not perfect in that. Um, but I try to listen. And I can tell you that there's 
when you have relationships with people, it doesn't matter if it's a marriage relationship or a friend relationship or a church relationship or whatever. When people speak, they want to be listened to. They want to be heard. And if all we do is shut them up and or ignore them, then we're damaging that relationship, that bond between husband and wife, wife and husband, children, children and parents, parents and children. I, I, I believe in strictness with children, but I also believe that as those children grow up and they start asking questions, somebody needs to start giving them answers. It's just wisdom, isn't it? And so sometimes God speaks and we don't listen. We hear it. We think it's for somebody else or, well, pastor boy, he's in a foul mood today. But let's read what God said. In fact, I want to pray first and then we'll read. Father, we ask your blessings now upon this word. Bless this message. And Lord, I, I thank you, God, for letting me hear the testimony of some people this morning. I needed that. And so, Father, I thank you, God, for opening up my eyes and um, helping me today. I love you for that. And I love this church, and I ask you to bless it now in Jesus' name. Amen. So Ezekiel, this after chapter 1, Ezekiel has just seen God coming down literally in a chariot right in front of him. And, in, and um, uh, there at the end of, of, of chapter 1, uh, he sees the likeness of the glory of the Lord, and he fell upon his face, and he heard a voice. And so in chapter 2, verse 1, he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. And the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me, and set me upon my feet. Now stop right there. Let me just analyze this for just a minute. Did you catch what your Bible just told you? Ezekiel stood and the Spirit entered into him when the voice spoke to him. How do, how do we receive the Spirit of God? Is it Do I go around slapping everybody like monkeys on the head or conking their heads together like mo or whatever to make a big show about it like I've got the Holy Spirit in my fingertips and I'm going to give it to you? No, Paul said over in Galatians, he said, how, how did you get the Spirit? By the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? You got the Spirit by the hearing of faith. The Spirit of God entered into you like it did the mighty army of God in Ezekiel 37. And that army stood when the Spirit entered into them. And they had life and they had breath. And here Ezekiel, I mean, I, I'm just now catching this. I've read this dozens and dozens of times. But I'm just now catching this that when the Spirit spoke unto him, or when, when the voice spoke unto him, the Spirit entered into him. And maybe some of the problems that you're dealing with or whatever it is you're going through may be a lack of the Holy Ghost working in you because God says you're listening to everybody in the world except me. So I'm going to hold back for a while. So verse 3, and he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me. Boy, can we say amen to, like, that would be America right now. Amen? Melissa, you said something about this lady was talking about a church. What was the big deal about what was going on in her church? Oh my goodness. So she's in the midst of a rebellious church, sounds like. And this is what we're hearing all over the country. 
Son of man, I send to thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. For they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. That means they're bullheaded and stubborn. And any preacher could preach his guts out Preach until his voice left him. Preached until he nearly passed out from exhaustion. And nothing of what he said would even make a dent into their stiffness that's in their heart. Nothing changes them. We spoke, we were talking about iron this morning and what it represents in the Bible. And it represents, I'm not changing, I'm not moving, I'm not bending I'm not conforming. I'm not doing anything. This is the way I am. And I, boy, I tell you what, you probably heard people say that. Well, you just have to excuse me. This is the way I am. And this, I'm not changing for anybody. That's impudent. And that is the, uh, a stiff-hearted person. And I say to you as your pastor, as your preacher, as the man who is the watchman over your soul, don't ever be guilty of the sin of being stiff-hearted. God has changes that He is wants to make in your life. And if you love Him and you say, God, you can have me do whatever you want, God will make those changes in your life. But will be. And I tell you what, I think our churches are full of people who are stiff-hearted. They don't want God to change them. They don't want God to change their family. They don't want God to change their traditions. They don't want God to change their minds on issues. They, want, they don't want anything like that. And yet they want to belong to a church. They want to be on a committee somewhere. They want to be on the board or whatever. But they don't want God changing them. And he said, I do, verse 4, he said, I do send thee unto them. And thou shalt say unto them, thus saith the Lord God. Now, I've tried over the last... 20 years to build a reputation for myself of preaching primarily just what the Bible says. Being careful that when I get a sermon together or some teaching that I include multiple Bible verses, as many as I can. Some people think maybe it's too much. I'm one of these like, I don't think there is too much of the Bible. But I, I want to be known as someone who says, thus saith the Lord God. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house. Yet shall know that there has been a prophet among them. Brother George, I tell you what, that testimony, oh my goodness. That lady is either going to, and here's how I see this. And this, the, a lot of people have the gospel preached to them and they never get saved. And some people wonder about that. Well, they had the gospel preached to them. Maybe they did get saved. But I'm going to tell you something. Let the, if you're saved, it'll be known. Amen. I want witnesses to the fact that I'm in heaven when I die. But what happens is the gospel can be preached to people for one of two reasons. Either God is going to use that to save them and change their life and make them a new creature. Or he's telling them the gospel knowing that they are going to reject it. And so that when they stand before God in the day of judgment, they will not be able to say, well, I never heard it. God will play back on some screen somewhere and show them, look, this is that day that you heard that message. This is the day when the preacher said these things. This is the day when you read something out of the Bible or whatever it was. I was dealing with you then. You didn't turn to it. And so now you're going to bear the responsibility of your actions. You're going to be judged by your works. And that's what he means here. Yet shall they know. He said whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. They will know that a prophet, the word of God, has been in their midst. They'll know it by the time it's all said and done. Now I'm going to say to you this morning that 
my responsibility as your pastor. And I, I'll be honest with you, I do not have somebody in mind preaching this. I don't. I really don't. But my responsibility to you as pastor is to tell you things that are right and true according to the Word of God and also, and I've learned this the hard way, is to tell you things that you do not want to hear. I've done that at times and lost friends, lost church members. Over 25 some odd, 26 years maybe, something like that. That's what happens. I didn't want to be that way. I wanted to be Mr. Nice Guy and everybody liked me and we filled the place with people that all like Mike Hoggard and everybody's happy. And God showed me that that's not always how it's going to be, that I have to say things that I don't want to say to people that don't want to hear it. And that's how it is. So the reason why I say certain things or the reason why I may emphasize certain things at certain times is because I'm watching for your soul and I know what happens to people. You start letting a little bit of sin in their life or they start letting a little bit of complacency in their life and there's a lack of the Word of God going into their life. I know what can happen to good garden dirt if it's not plowed every now and then. Does that make sense? I got me a, an electric handheld tiller. It is my new best friend now, Jim. I got a flower bed there in front of our house that spits up these stupid thorn things. I have no idea what they are. I hate them. And I've been, I've been preaching on this for years. For 20 some odd years, I've been trying to get rid of these stupid things. And they just keep growing back and growing back. So I got me a handheld tiller now, electric motor, and it's zzzz. And the first time I hit that dirt, it's almost like I hit concrete. That dirt was as hard as a rock. You know why? Because I hadn't worked it. I hadn't done anything with it for a couple of years. Are you listening to this? Now, this is good stuff. But now, I get that tiller and I get out there in that flower garden and, boy, that dirt just flies everywhere now. And I can mold that and I can get those nasty uh, thistles up and I can get that crabgrass out of there real easy now. Because I broke up the fallow ground. And that's what it takes. When, if we want God to make changes in our life, that fallow ground, that hardness and that stiff neck hard-heartedness in our life has to be broken up so the seed of the Word of God can get in there. Do you believe that? Say amen. Now verse 6. Thou son of man. And here we go right here. This is me. Verse 6, be not afraid of them. Uh-oh. That's me. I'm Mr. Chicken, Mr. Scaredy Cat. Run, run away from every fight that my mouth started. And i tell you what I am. Thou son of man, be not afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Ooh, yeah, that, that gets me. Because like I said, I, I'm pretty... Thin skin. My mama will tell you. And I don't like for people to talk down to me. I don't like for people to talk bad about me. It bothers me. Some preachers that don't, they can handle it. I'm not that way. And so to me, look at what he says here. Neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee. And I'm here to tell you, I've got my share of them. And thou dost dwell among scorpions. Look at who God said he's... You're, uh, preachers, good preachers all across this country and all across this world are trying to preach to people to change their lives and they're doing nothing but preaching to a bunch of scorpions. You know what scorpions represent? We're studying this in, in Revelation. Scorpions have stings. Sting represents the sting of death. And what is the sting of death? It's sin. Sin and the strength of sin is the law, the Bible says. So thou dost dwell among scorpions. In other words, you're dwelling in a, in a house full of people that are nothing but wicked, hell-deserving sinners that have the fate of death on them. And he said, be not afraid of their words. 
nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And trust me, I've stood up here and preached the Word of God to people. And when I saw the looks on some people's face, and I'm not talking about anything recent. Again, I don't have anybody in mind. This goes all the way back to 1990 when I first started preaching out at Richwoods. I've seen the faces of people that I knew did not like what I just said. Going to churches and preaching at other men's churches and saying things that I knew the preacher didn't like. That's hard to take. It makes me want to change. It makes me want to soften. It makes me want to not say things because I see people's faces and I'm going, oh, I just made them mad. Oh, I don't like that. I can't handle that very well. That's me. They're a rebellious house. Verse 7, and thou shalt speak my words unto them. And that's, folks, I promise you as your pastor, every sermon that I give you, I'm going to give you the word of God. I promise you. And if I stop doing that, Throw me out. Get rid of me and get somebody in here that will preach it. Amen? And I mean that. I mean it. You people need the Word of God. You crave the Word of God. You don't want some preacher going off on the things of this world, being conformed to this world and preaching sermons out of this world. You want somebody, even if I invite somebody to come and preach in this church, i got to know that they believe the Bible before they come in here and preach. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And I tell you that one of the biggest mistakes that I was destined to make, I was going to do this. And one of the biggest mistakes that preachers are making right now is that they're preaching to a wicked, rebellious generation of people and their preachers are saying, well, I can't get them into a church. I can't get them into a, a church if I'm preaching hellfire and brimstone. I can't get them into a church if we're singing out the hymn books. can't get them into a church while we're preaching out the old King James Bible. can't get them in here. So I'm going to do away with all that and I'm going to change the music. We're going to shut down all the lights. I'm going to go use 50 different versions of the Bible or none at all. And I bet I can fill the house that way. And that's exactly what they've done. It's exactly what they've done. The whole Hillsong thing, the whole purpose-driven church thing, all of that was done. Rick Warren, when he went to build a church in uh, Orange County, California, one of the richest areas in the world, he went around and asked everybody in that county what it would take to get those people into his church. And they said, well, we don't like them old hymns. We don't like that organ. We don't like somebody telling us that we're doing something wrong. We don't want, we don't want a bunch of these and thous and this and all that stuff. So Rick Warren built a church, an entire ministry around throwing all that out. He did exactly what God said not to do. Uh, be not, verse 8, Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. My responsibility before I preach to you is to preach this to me. If I want you to eat it, I got to eat it first. Does that, make, does that sound fair enough? Ezekiel 2 verse 9, And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. I love this. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. And there was written therein, positive power, positive thinking, your best life now, and Joyce Meyer is God's woman. Is that what it says? What was written on there? Read it to me. Lamentations. Lamentations means you lament over the things that have happened. You grieve over sins that you've committed. Mournings is you are mourning over things that have been killed off, things that have died, relationships that have been destroyed because of your sin. Woe are usually come in the form of warnings. God says, woe unto thee, woe unto thee, woe unto thee. That's God saying, 
I'm giving you a warning right now. Don't do this. But the people go right out and do it anyway. Parents, let me ask you a question. Does it bother you? Parents, when you say something to your children or your child and you give them an instruction, you give them a commandment, you give them an order, you tell them this is what I want and they don't do what you tell them to do, does that bother you? Is there consequences in your house? If, you don't, if that child does not do what you tell them to do, are there consequences for that? I'm not saying I'm the parent because I'm not. God is. And if God says, I want this done, and you don't do it, there's going to be consequences. Raise your hand if you've learned that already. Raise your hand. That's what's, that's what's written on there. Not a bunch of, everybody's okay, God loves you just the way you are, don't change anything, uh, let's just all have joy and happy feelings, and I'm not going to make anybody mad now, nobody's going to be upset with me. Everybody's going to like me. But that's not what's written on the book. So, that's in now in chapter 3. He continues it and he says, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll. And go speak unto the house of Israel. So the process is, before the preacher can preach to you, he must first eat the roll. I've got to know what this... Paul, Paul put in the list of qualifications for a bishop is that he was not to be a novice. You know what that is? A newbie. A probie. A probationary. A young man who doesn't know anything about life, doesn't know anything about anything, and doesn't, and that's, where, that's who I used to be. Good grief. God said not a novice. With somebody who knows the Word of God, somebody who knows a little bit about life. By the way, I do believe this. God said if a man's going to be the bishop or pastor of a church, he should be the husband of one wife. And I take that literally. I think God gave me a wife so that I would understand, a wife and children, so that I would understand how in dealing with my wife and children, how I should deal with the people who come to this church. That if I don't love them like I love my wife and love my children and my grandchildren, if I don't love you the same way I love them, I am not fit to be the pastor of this church. Son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll, and go and speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that roll. I like to think it's a glazed sweet roll with cinnamon in it. That sounds good, doesn't it? Amen? Now watch this. Son of man, cause thy belly to eat it and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Because if you're right with God, you read things like this out of the Bible, it don't cut you in half. And even if it does, you say, God, I love you for that. Do that again when next time I need it. Amen. God, take a rod after me and chasing me be times. Lord, don't spare the rod in my life. I want to be like you. I want to go to heaven. I want my family to see me living for you and doing right. And if I make a mistake, try to make the mistake right. Confess my own sins. Amen. I'm going to tell you what. Those of you men and grandpas who've had to confess sins even to your own children or grandchildren, they'll never forget it. You may have just saved their soul. Now, John had this same thing happen. Turn to Revelation 10. Revelation 10, 8. Look at what it says. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel. Which said, Isn't that something that, that we have an Old Testament illustration of it have a New Testament illustration of it. By the way, that's how the Bible works. You read a little bit here in the Old Testament and you see, wow, there's, here's, a, here's a book coming down out of heaven and he tells Ezekiel to read it. Then you're reading over Revelation, here's a book come down from heaven and 
He tells John to take it and eat it. And what did John find out? Verse 9, So I went to the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Isn't that something that's the same thing? There's one difference, however. Verse 10, I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Let me tell you something. I know that feeling. How I can read the Word of God and just have joy in my soul. Joy in my mouth. Mmm, boy, that's good. Oh, that's so good. Mm, 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 mm. And then when it hits my belly and I really start understanding what that means, I'm not doing so hot. Because while I enjoyed hearing the preaching of God's Word, I enjoy reading God's Word when I really get it down in my soul and understand what it means, sometimes it makes me pretty bitter. Not at anybody in particular except for me. Mike, you're guilty of that. Why did you do that, Mike? Mike, why did you treat that person that way? Mike, why did you retaliate that way? Mike, why did you say this to so-and-so? Why did you do this? Why did you even think this? And so in verse 11, he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And yes, I would like to give you all the honey and the butter and the sweetness of the Word of God. I would love to give you that, but I'm here to tell you that sometimes it's going to hit bitter. And you're going to get mad. And the, your best bet... Now, if, if I'm wrong about something then that's a different story. But if I've given you straight out the Word of God, and it hits you, and it burns you, and you're not happy about it, just remember something. I'm the mailman. And that's it. The mail was sent to you by the Holy Ghost. God wrote you a letter and said some things to you, and you didn't like it. But God meant it to change something about you. Can I hear you say amen? Lesson that I have to learn over and over again is to listen to the people around me, listen even to my own family, listen to my wife, listen to my daughters, my sons, listen to the people in this church. And I may not immediately like what I'm hearing but if I take it and ponder it for a while and pray about it I may just find out just how right those people really were and let me tell you from a preacher standpoint we don't like to admit when we're wrong I think God picks all the people that never likes to admit they're wrong and makes them preachers okay that's what I think because well let me let me move on back in Ezekiel chapter 3 he said unto me in verse 4, Son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel and speak with my words unto them. For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language. Now I do mission work. I love going to Kenya. But primarily, my job is here. And you folks, I understand you. You're Americans. I understand you. I get you. I know how you are. I know how you speak. You guys understand the words that I say, you understand, you understand, you even understand most of my jokes. Okay, that means that we know we have the same common background, okay? And he said, verse 5, For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. Not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely, had I sent thee to them... They would have hearkened unto thee. Isn't that something? That I can go to Kenya or wherever our ministry reaches in some foreign land. And the people over there will listen and they'll hear it. And they beg for me to come. Like they did in Kenya. They beg for me to come. Pastor, will you come and teach us? Will you come and preach to us? Will you come and do that? Yes, I'll do whatever it takes. And we went. And I asked 
say some hard things to them. First, the first day that I started preaching, I had to deal with the issue of some of them were women pastors. And God said, Mike, say it. Take them down through the scriptures and show them this is not right. You think I wanted to do that with them? Three, I think there was three women pastors standing there looking at me that I looked back and I knew they didn't like what I just said. Oh no, I'm in trouble. But they needed to hear it and they wanted to hear it. But then sometimes, I'll be honest with you, I just feel this way. I don't know if it's real or not. I don't know if it's true or not. I know the devil likes to play tricks with my head. But I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I get the feeling. I don't even like saying this. Because it sound, it's, it's just wicked the way it sounds. Sometimes I get the feeling that y'all ain't listening. I just say it that way. I beg you to come to services. I beg you to read your Bible. I try to teach you to pray and ask God for things. We open up the doors to this place twice a week, Sundays, Wednesdays. I'm doing live podcasts for people. And I don't, I, again, I, I don't like saying this because it just sounds so, it sounds ego is what it sounds like. And I hate it. So I'm not looking at you. But I know it's got to be true. That sometimes I'm preaching. But you're not listening. And that works hard on a preacher. It's not just me. It's any preacher. It works on them. It eats at them. It's like, it's like raising teenagers sometimes. Y'all, y'all ever done that? Yes. Helen, you ever raised a teenager? Yes. You tell them and tell them and tell them and tell them they don't listen. Because then I realize, Mike, sometimes the only way you would have learned things is if you... You were just hit in the face with it and made a stupid mistake and then you found out how true it was. Is that right? And I'd like for you to avoid that, but it may be unavoidable. So the word gets preached and then we rebel against it or we just ignore it or don't listen to it or don't give heed to it. And then we go out and do exactly what God said don't do. And then we go, oh, that's why God said that. Uh, he said in verse um, eight, 7 again, But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. For, they, for all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads, as an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead. In, in other words, my face is going to be like a stone to you, when you look at my face while I'm preaching and you realize I'm not changing my mind and I'm not going to change what I just said, if I read it from the Word of God, I'm, it's not changeable. It's not up for debate or discussion or it's not up for everybody's input on maybe how we could do this differently or say it differently. If God said it and I say this is thus saith the Lord, when you see me, you know that I'm not changing it. And as weak as I am in relationships and trying to get along with people and, and wanting everybody to like me, God has put it in me over the years. He's used some good men to do it. He's used even my wife to help me. But God has made me when I'm standing here or when I'm online, it, my face is adamant. And if it's thus saith the Lord, I'm not apologizing for it. And I'm not going to change it. 
even if I start out with the word UFO. I'm not, I'm not, listen, I'm not changing my mind on it. I'm convinced something evil is approaching. Very evil. Neither just, so he said, uh, fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, so they be a rebellious house. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, all my words, I'm almost done, that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart, and hear with thine ears, and go get thee to them of the captivity unto the children of thy people, and speak unto them, and tell them, Thus saith the Lord God, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear. Then the Spirit took me up, and I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing, saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. Oh, listen up, people. I desire this church to be in the blessing of the glory of the Lord. And I want the glory of the Lord in this place. Somebody say amen. And I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touch one another and the noise of the wheels over against them. And it is, that seems UFOs. Anyway, and the noise of a great rushing. So the Spirit lifted me up. That's why I'm still here. And took me away. I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit. But the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. I wouldn't be here. I would not be here. I would have folded up a long time ago. I promise you that. I wouldn't be here. In fact, I wouldn't be anywhere. Preaching anywhere. Nothing. If it hadn't been for God. I want you to bow your head this morning. And I'm going to just open up the mourner's benches this morning if you want to come. But you know me, I, you can pray wherever you want to. I don't care where you pray. But I, at the beginning of this message, I asked you, did any of this apply to you? You're the only one who can make that judgment. You're the only one who can say to themselves, boy, that nailed me. I don't listen to God the way I should. I don't hear Him the way I'm supposed to. And don't, I mean, you, I, you can pray for me. I, I appreciate that. But don't think that I'm trying to get a pity party out of this message. Because I'm not. The, the, if the hand of the Lord is going to be strong upon me, then He's going to hold me up. And I'm, and, I, and I'm not worried about what will happen afterwards. I know, God will, I know God will take care of me. But it's you I'm worried about. You as a church, as a collective, you as an individual that I care about. And I know what can happen when we disobey God and we get out of God's will and we get into some really, really bad, terrible things. I'm telling you, if you live through it. God will make it so you will wish that you had never been born than to go through that again. That's what God does. And He does that because He loves His people. So ask yourself the question this morning, is this you? Our Father, we come before you this morning. God, we thank you that I'm looking outside that gentle rain is out there again and Lord it's sweet to the ground the ground needed it that ground was getting hard and the grass wasn't growing and Lord that's us when it don't rain and there's a famine and our old heart gets hard and the seed of the word of God goes in but it has no effect on us and before long we're not bearing any fruit and we stand in danger of your holy angels coming and taking an axe to the roots of our lives and chopping us up and casting us into the fire. God, I don't want that. I don't want that for me. I don't want that for my wife. I don't want that for any of my children or none of my grandchildren. I don't want that for these people here. Or anybody else you'll send to this church. I don't want it for the people online. I don't want it for the good people of Kenya that I love so much. Father, I don't want it for anybody. I don't, I don't want that. Father, for the man that I had a run in with this week. I don't want that for him. I don't want anybody who knows me 
to end up in hell fire for eternity. I'm hoping that because of something you laid on my heart to say, just like you did with Brother George this week, something you laid on my heart to say at some point would speak to somebody and it would make all the difference in their life. So Father, help us to be hearers of the word first and then doers. And Lord, whoever this sermon is for, let it be for them. Let others rejoice in that the word of God was preached. And Father, help us to take the things, Lord, that wasn't for us today and store them in a storehouse because we're going to need them one of these days because it will be us. And bless your word and bless these people and bless that rain, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.